Why did you choose to write your book in such a revealing way? I really felt strongly that governance in Nigeria has become a sort of conspiracy of silence in which people go into government, go through experiences both good and bad, go both youthful and useless and come out and keep quiet because they want to be invited back again. I have no desire to be invited back again so I felt I was in a position to be very frank about my own experiences and my own opinions of events as well as people and processes. Uh, so that's what I did. Is It was a very difficult uh, uh, decision to take but I felt that the country needed to have some insider glimpse into how we run our affairs and what we can do to improve it. Uh, in addition, I also wanted young people to understand that we are all human. Uh, even though many would consider us to be successes while we are in government, uh, a few of us that served under Obasanjo, uh, we were human. We had foibles, we had weaknesses like everyone else, and uh, there is nothing stopping any one of them to be as good or even better. Um, and uh, I hope that that goal has been achieved. Were you ever interested in running for the office of the president? Are you interested in running for the office of the president? This is another issue um, some critics have raised because in the book you express that you were never interested. And they say you were. What actually happened? You know, um, maybe because in the last few years we have depreciated the office of the president to a point that anybody thinks he can be president. Uh, but I think running for president is very big deal. I think that many people do not appreciate the burden and the weight of the office of the president. They only see the convoys and the private jet and uh, German medical care as presidency. Presidency is more than that. I have been privileged at a relatively young age to work with two presidents, General Abdul Salami Abu Bakr and President Obasanjo. And I know how difficult that job is. And I would not wish it on my enemy. Certainly, I would not wish it on me. Um, if circumstances force you to do it, yeah, sure, you do it. But it's not something that anyone would want to go out of his way to look for or spend money for if you really want to do the job. Because the post Jonathanian Nigeria will be a very messy place. And whoever is going to inherit this grand mess is going to have to work 23 hours a day, seven days a week just to lift Nigeria out, out of the morass we have found ourselves in. So I, 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 I honestly uh, don't uh, find uh, the prospects of being president very attractive, uh, unlike what most people think. Um, some reviewers and critics have wondered why you have quoted very long dialogues verbatim in your book. Um, they doubt the credibility of the book because of that. So how do you respond to that? I recorded when this was happening. I keep detailed notebooks. Uh, by the time I finished my four years as minister, I had 47 notebooks in which I recorded events and conversations verbatim uh, as they were happening or immediately after they happened. It's not that I remembered everything, but I went through my notes and extracted what I felt was relevant. Uh, it's my recollection. You can disagree with it. Uh, write your own recollection. Uh, let Nigerians judge the two and place weight to both our recollections and uh, decide which to believe. I, I cannot write a book that everyone is happy with or pleased with, particularly people that do not come out smelling like roses in the book. That is understandable, but I, I, I was conscious of uh, the likelihood that I would write such a book. And I kept detailed notes. I, anyone that worked with me knew that I never went anywhere without my uh, small notebooks. And I kept detailed notes. And I still have them. In fact, my publisher wants us to publish the notes as ministerial diaries. Just verbatim recording of what I took in cabinet meetings, in meetings with uh, investors and public servants. I kept detailed notes. I was very uh, meticulous in keeping those notes because that's how I was trained. I'm a quantity surveyor by training and quantity surveying uh, training teaches you to take notes when you meet with clients, with contractors, with, with other consultants because we move around a lot. You can
start a project and before you finish it, you move on to another. You have to leave behind detailed notes for whoever inherits the project to be able to catch up. So it, it, it was something that I had learned to do even as a private practitioner and I maintained it throughout my years in government. I didn't rely on my memory. My memory is not a good, uh, it's not a very good one, um, but I kept detailed notes. Why did you choose to reveal very private conversations? That's another thing some of the critics of your book are saying. You revealed very personal, private conversations, and you put them in the book. Why, why do you do that? Uh, there is no one-on-one -on -one conversation that I reproduced in the book that did not have to do with governing Nigeria. I, I never revealed any one-on-one -on -one conversation when it had to do with a person's girlfriend or any marital problems he's having, okay? Or if he was facing financial problems uh, that were personal to him, right? Everything that I revealed uh, that was one-to-one one -one conversation had to do with governing Nigeria. So it's, it's a public interest. You cannot uh, sit and plan to do something bad against our country and you say it's private to you. Nobody should talk about it just because you don't want it revealed. That is not right. Uh, anything that we do as public servants in the course of public service is, should be available for every Nigerian to know what is the secret in governing a country. You, you, you took an oath of office to be fair, to be just to everyone, to do right. So wh why, why are you afraid if it comes out? I have no problem anyone, you know, publishing any private conversation I've had with him that have to do with the governance of Nigeria. Uh, and that is, that, that, that is my attitude. And I think um, I, I, I also wanted people to know that in the course of public service, you should be very mindful what you say or what you do, because it is the things we say and do that determine whether our country makes progress or not. What was your experience like writing the accidental public servant? Yeah, well, y you know, um, I think the hardest part for me is, the, is writing, you know, because I'm not trained to be a writer. I, I, I'm, I'm trained to be an applied mathematician. I'm a quantity surveyor. I'm more comfortable with numbers than words. So the, the, the way I made progress with that was to just record what I wanted to say in the book. If you read the book, you see that it's fairly conversational. Yeah. It's not written with the literary style of, uh, of, of a real uh, uh, author. I, 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 I try to be conversational, but that's because I recorded chapter by chapter what I wanted to say, and it was transcribed by a firm in the U.S. Uh, into the written word, and then I edited that. So that that helped somewhat. That was difficult, you know, having to have a base material to start. Then the second thing was getting all the materials I needed. I have all my files. I have uh, uh, lots of documents, but they were in Nigeria at the time that I was in exile. So we had to arrange for them to be shipped gradually when people were coming to bring with some of my files that I needed to refer to and so on. Th 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 that was hard because researching a book like this, trying to get dates right and so on, was, was, was quite difficult. Uh, and then going through the notebooks and picking what was important. Because when you've been minister for four years and director general of privatization agency for another four years, there, there is a lot of stuff that has uh, happened. And you have to pick what is important. This book is not the whole story, but it's just a snapshot. So I had to pick and choose what was important. And in fact, at the end of the day, when I, had, when I finished the, the manuscript and handed it over to my publisher, he took the decision that we must remove at least five chapters from the original manuscript because it was too big. <laughs> you know, it was very big. And that was even before we put in the appendices and the, and the footnotes and all that. So we removed five chapters from the original manuscript, which is now going to be the subject of a second book that I'm working on. But it was difficult. I mean, it took me the better part of three years to, to write this. And still, there were still errors, dates, some dates we got wrong. Uh, one of the dates was an editing error because someone thought that the date I put there was wrong, so it was changed and all that. And um, it's, it's, I, I did not quite realize 
uh, how much it takes to put together a book. Uh, I've learned for the first time what it is. And because of that, I now respect authors even more than I used to. Uh, but it, it, was, it was also a very um, interesting, inspiring, and stimulating experience. And uh, with mixtures of sadness and joy at the same time. Because sometimes when you have to relate events that were painful, you have to relieve those events. Uh, but, you know, on the whole, I think it was a worthwhile effort. I, 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 I would do it again and again. I'm sure there's going to be a second edition to this book. What would you change when you're working on a second edition? I'm not sure I'll change much. I'll correct some of the errors in dates. Uh, I would add a chapter on NITEL, the privatization of NITEL, because many people thought I just dodged the subject completely. But that's because it was one of the Two of the chapters, two of the five chapters removed from the book had to do with the privatization of NITEL, uh, which I will go into some detail in the next book. But I would have uh, answered some of the questions that were raised uh, on, on NITEL. I would have added at least a chapter on the privatization of NITEL. Um, and perhaps uh, edited down some of the stuff we did on public service reforms, and what we did in Abuja, because I noticed that people were not interested in, in that, you know. People were more interested in the gossipy uh, human parts, you know, where someone did something wrongly or, you know. People are more interested in gossip than substance. And I, I found that a little uh, shocking. Uh, so I would have combined uh, some of the things we did, like Abuja, public service reform, and... Uh, and privatization into fewer chapters because nobody even referred to them in the commentary. And I thought that was interesting because that's what I did. The rest of the, the stories about that time were collateral issues for me. Uh, what was substantive for me was we sold some government companies and they are doing well. We, 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 we tried to fix Abuja. We tried to make Abuja an orderly city and we did this and that. We took some really tough decisions, but nobody seemed to be interested in that. Which is, which, is, which is quite interesting, which says a lot about human nature. Can you share with us the books and the authors that have influenced you the most? Among Nigerian authors, I think Chinua Achebe is the one I have the greatest respect for, uh, with Things Fall Apart. I've read, you know, Arrow of God is my favorite, actually, not Things Fall Apart. Things Fall Apart were the first I read, and it was interesting. Uh, no longer at ease, a man of the people. I mean, Chino Ajebe was, 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 was great, you know, may he so rest in peace. Um, uh, I have also read some, some of Cyprian Ikwensi's works. So that's among Nigerian authors. Uh, Wale Shoenka I found difficult uh, because he writes in very, very, I mean, to understand Wale Shoenka, you have to have a thesaurus or dictionary by your side. So I found that very difficult, but I enjoyed The Man Died because it was something that, it was a story that had to do with human rights and, you know, and, and, and you know, and so I connected with the man died. I like the interpreters, uh, but my favorite Wole Shoenka book is Brother Jero, The Trials of Brother Jero, and this we, 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 we read while in secondary school. But I would say, apart from the holy book of Islam, the Quran, which I read at a very young age. By the time I was 10, I had read the Quran cover to cover with English translation. The book that has influenced my thinking the most is a work of fiction written by an American Russian immigrant to the U.S. called Ayn Rand, The Fountainhead, the story of an architect who wanted to design buildings completely different from the way buildings were designed at the time and of course the whole system ganged up against him and he fought and fought and prevailed in the end that's the kind of uh, heroic story that i liked and uh, and in many ways it defined for me what i needed to do in my life if you want to do things if you want to change the way things are done if you want to change the world if you want to effect change so that there is progress you must expect opposition but you must also believe that one is a majority if you believe you're right. And uh, that, I read that book when I was 18 and it just changed the way I looked at the world. Um, and Ayn Rand still remains one of my favorites.